Hi, everyone. Over the past couple of weeks, I've been talking to a couple of folks in the Forest Friend Treasure Hunt that brought up some interesting things. I just wanted to pass this uh, information off to you. And I'm, I'm curious what you think about it. Our, one of them is known as Street. Although him and I don't always agree on everything. And in fact, maybe you know he doesn't like me, whatever. I do think that he's a smart guy. And he's kind of a voice of reason. And he made an interesting video recently about the location and how the poem is a map and, and so on and so forth. And he makes a lot, a lot of sense. You go check out his video, Jay Street. And another guy who this is more or less a friend of mine named Rick, Rick Nowak from The Chase. Uh, him and I were talking on the phone and we we're talking, we're working on other projects together. We weren't discussing Forrest Fenn at all. Um, but he brought up an interesting point to me, and I wanted to share that with you. And he told me that it, it was like a scavenger hunt or something like that, a, a TV show that he'd seen a long time ago where they took like 10 people and they put them in New York City, but none of those people knew each other, and they had a goal. They all had to meet at the same place, and anybody that met, if everybody that was at the same place would end up sharing a prize. So nobody was competing against each other because everybody that was there was going to be getting a reward, provided they were all at the same place. And ultimately, they all ended up there, nine of them, except for one guy. He was off biased on his own. And what, I'm, what I mean about that is when you, if you were in a challenge like that, okay, and you were in a place like, let's say, I'm not going to talk about New York. That's where it was. But let's say it was in Florida. I, and no matter where you are in Florida, all 10 of you who don't know each other, you don't know what you look like, no way to contact each other, I say, let's meet there. But I don't tell you where there is. How many of those people end up in the same place? Well, according to Rick, nine people ended up in the same place in New York. And what they did, the smart ones, is they went to um, the Statue of Liberty, I believe, or it might have been the Empire State Building. because. You're going to go in the most obvious place that's relative to the area that you're being told to go to. So if you're in Florida, the most obvious place to meet would be Disney. Now, you're going to have that one guy that's going to end up in Miami or at Key West because he's going to say, well, Key West is a great place. And, you know, I went there because I knew everybody would go there. Well, see, he was using personal bias. Instead, he should have just backed up and say, well, the most logical place to go would be somewhere in the center. And Orlando is so well known that even if you weren't from Florida, you could say, you know, let's all meet at Disney. And everybody would meet at Disney. It would seem like the most logical place. The way he worded it to me, he goes, Troy, let's say I gave uh, this map of the United States to 10 different people. And I said, okay, let's all meet there. But I had no idea where the people are coming from. And I have no idea where I want him to go to. Where would you go? Now, my answer would be probably somewhere west of the Mississippi, kind of because it's kind of in the center of the United States, right? Well, he got a better answer and is even more specific. He said, I would go to Kansas. There's a place in Kansas that's the center, the geographical center of the United States. So it would make sense that that. You know, oh, where these 10 people were scattered around the United States, they would all meet at the geographical center of the United States. I don't know where it is. Let's say it's right here. It doesn't matter. You could easily figure it out. And probably nine people would end up there. You would always have that one guy that would end up in San Francisco because it's a cool place. You know, but that's a cool place to him. It's not going to be cool to everybody. So you've got to use logic, right? So. Now, let's take a look at Forrest Fenn's treasure hunt. Forrest Fenn said that the poem is a map, and a map that will lead you to a very precise location that has this treasure chest. Now, obviously, whenever you're dealing with a map and directions, you got to know one of two things. you got to know the starting location, and it's got to be very precise. For example, let's say that I told you to go on 35. 35 goes from way up in Minnesota all the way down through Texas, right? So there's exits numbered or mile markers, right? 
I could tell you to go to mile marker 100 on 35 and head south. That's a precise starting location. It doesn't matter where you are in the United States. You could you could figure out where that starting location is, right? I would tell you. I'm saying Highway 35, mile marker 100. Well, I'm not going to give you the ending location because if I told you that the treasure was right here at that intersection, that wouldn't be much of a treasure hunt. So I absolutely can't give you a destination. And Fortis Friend always said the starting location. If you don't know where to start, you have nothing. And this is one of the points I was discussing with both Rick and then also just on YouTube with Street. We all agreed that the poem was a map. And we kind of had it a little bit easy because we knew that that map that led to a location that was somewhere within this relative area. Right? So that helped us a little bit. But we still have no exact starting location. And of course, we don't have an ending. He didn't tell us where the chest was. He didn't put an X there. But he always said, like I'm going to repeat this a million times, if you don't know where to start, you have nothing. So in our solution, it seemed logical. At least I know I wasted from 2014 to 2017 with good solves. But they were all based on where I thought where warm water salt was. And like Street said, everybody's solve can work. It'll lead you to a special location in your thoughts. But the thing is, there was a physical chest. And only one set of directions is going to lead you to that chest. And all of it hinges on the starting point. Now, Forrest Fenn used vague clues. If I didn't tell you to go on 35 mile mark 100, and instead I said, go on the highway, and then go two miles and make a left. Well, which highway are you going to go on in this map? Let's say I, I got a little bit more bold, and I said, well, go on the highway, head south for two miles, and then make a left. Well, again, okay, maybe I ruled out highways that go east to west. I know it's got to go north to south. But there's billions of roads that, that, that'll that fit that qualification. So, and Forrest Friend joked about this. He goes, one thing I didn't, I didn't think people would do was go to a map so quick. Everybody started pulling out maps. And they were going, well, I think where warm water salt is flaming gorge. Well, where I think warm water salt is uh, the sink. Well, where I think warm water salt is Madison Junction. Well, where I think warm water salt is Agua Fria. Well, where I think warm water salt is up in uh, Dinosaur National Park. Well, well, I, well, you get the point. Everybody had their own bias. And the problem with the clues is not only is the starting clue extremely vague, the other clues are too. So you could go to any place in, the, in, in Wyoming that you believe would be warm water salt would be on a mountain somewhere. And you're going to look for water, right? A creek, right? What, even though he didn't say it, a creek, a river, whatever, a lake. You're going to look for something, right? And you're going to find a canyon. I don't, I don't care where you go in the, in the Rockies. There's going to be a canyon close to it, right? And down, well, all water moves down. That's how it works. That's how physics works. They get in a canyon down, you know. And so, so he's basically leading everybody everywhere. There's no nothing. So. That, you know, is telling you how important the starting location was. And that's why I throw away all of that. And that's why I went back with Sam and I'm like, look, you got to be right. He was the only one since 2013 that actually came up with something that worked. The poem is actually telling you where to start. Once you have that starting location and you do what the poem says, you just get a map of that historical location. You go there and you apply the map. And the map is going to work now because you're at a very precise starting location and you know you didn't bias it because the poem told you to go there.
you know, if if you're in in um in uh, New York City, for example, and I told you to go to the statue, and there's a lot of statues in New York. But the first statue that should come to your mind is the Statue of Liberty. I mean, it's just, you know, that gets back to what Rick was saying. So I can do that. So I'm relying on the fact that you're going to be at that statue, you know, because everything is relative to the location that he sends you to, right? I mean, I'm sure everybody would admit that. You know, if we were in, in Niagara, okay, and I said, uh, you know, we, let's go to the falls. There's probably water, other waterfalls there, but who would not go to Niagara Falls? You would, again, be a complete idiot, right? So it's all, it's all relative. The problem is Forrest Fenn had this huge area, and he, and he couldn't give you the ending location because it's a treasure hunt. So he had to be bold and put the starting location in there. Because once, once he did that, now he can be sure the poem will work. Because everything is going to be relative to that location. Warm water salt should be obvious. And then the canyon down, you know, and the creek that he mentions in there, you know, all of that stuff, the home of Brown, everything should be obvious and fit that location like a glove. And you know you've arrived there with no bias because all you used was the poem. You didn't use any of his backstory. You didn't use any of his books. You didn't need to know about Eric Sloan. You didn't need to know about artwork. You didn't need to know about Indians. You didn't need to know about his childhood. You didn't need to know that he was rich. Nothing. All you did was use the poem to solve. And that is why I believe he kept on talking about the S. Eliot. Because he's t- hinting at the fact that you're going to be able to arrive where you begin and know the place for the very first time. So in other words, the first time you see the poem, you're using it to solve for where warm water's hot. That's all you're doing. Now that is the end of the first story. That's the first Omega. Now you're going to go to that spot and you're going to solve the clues based on that starting location and you're going to get the treasure chest. That's the second Omega. You're done. You know, and it should be very straightforward and require no backstory other than information that's readily available at the historical location that he's that the poem sends you to, and um the poem. Nothing else. Nothing else had to be needed. And and when people look at a at a at an easy solution, such as the one that I put out there that we used. And, and, and I want you to, to say this, too. <clears throat> Some people might consider that bragging, but bragging for what? Yeah, I would like to get some respect for having been one of the first people to solve for warm, warm water salt with my team. Again, that, when I say we, I mean me and Sam Smith, or Sam Smith and I. Sam Smith knew about Try to Wheel, and he knew how to reveal it. But what Sam S- Smith didn't know is everything that I told you and how the phone works from beginning to end and how the title to the gold is the word treasure and how it proves it. And he also didn't completely understand how we picked the words that we picked. Okay. And that Terry scam with Marvel Gaze, what did that really mean? And, you know, he didn't put all that together. I did all of that. I'm the one that figured out five springs, not Sam. And then we both sitting there scratching our head because we both looked at, you know, this wheel area for years. And, and yet, you know, why would I be bragging about essentially something that makes me look stupid? Because here where I was sitting on it all this time, and I didn't find the treasure. And, and it's funny because Forrest Fenn must have been wanting to, you know, slap me because I told him in May that we were going here and here and here. And the first year was right at the wheel, and I showed you, it's kind of northwest of the wheel, those positions. And then there was an area just um, up closer to the wheel that we were going to check out. And those were Sam's spots that we wanted to check out first. I told Forrest that after we do that, the second Boots on the Ground in June, because I told him the first time we go out, we're going to go here, 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 where Sam wants to go. We're going to do that on June 6th. 
which is my wedding anniversary for 39 years of marriage. And then I said, after that, if, if we don't find it there, we're going to go to Five Springs. So he was probably like saying, you idiot, you know, because he probably knew at that time that Jack was going to Five Springs. So Jack was probably the only one that told him in May the correct, at least within the correct relative area of Five Springs. Because I don't believe Jack knew the, the solution. Um, he didn't know the ending that I showed you. And the only reason why he knew where warm water salt was, because he took it from our salt. And like I said, I mean, Jack, if he's the finder, he deserves it. Because we willingly put that information out there. We knew that this can happen. So I'm, I, why would I brag about losing? You know, there is no second place. There's, for, I'm not entitled to the treasure chest. We didn't find the chest. That was what you had to do. You had to solve the poem and find the chest. We didn't do part two. But anyway, I thought that you would want to take a look at that because, you know, like I'm telling you guys, what you're solved, you should be able to, number one, show me where does the poem tell you to begin at your location? How does the poem work when applied to that location without knowing any backstory again and leads you to a precise spot? And three, it's in an area that would be legal for him to hide it. And I just want to mention that again, because I know some of you people are not from the United States, but hiding a multi-million dollar treasure in any national park would be illegal in the United States. You can't do it. You're not even allowed to have um, geocache without restrictions. If you want to have a geocache in the national park, I believe the rules are, number one, you have to tell the park superintendent that you're doing it and where the geocache is hidden. Number two, it can't be there more than a year in the same, you'd have to go and take it and start over. Number three, it can't be worth more than $1,000. So there you go. You know, a national park is illegal. So, you know, I, I, I can't tell you guys what to do. Some of you think Boris Ben is, uh, you know, he didn't care about the law. He did what he did, you know, and he's dead now. He's on his deathbed. He could lie, whatever. Well, that's not true. Um, Forrest was, let's say, worth $50 million, let's just say. And he puts a $1 million treasure chest out there. Do you honestly believe that he would be insane enough to risk his entire estate of $50 million for a $1 million chest? Now, remember, he had no control over who was going to find it. So somebody could have found it and did what he said to do. If you find it in a national park, according to Forrest Van, you have to bring it to the park superintendent. Because the, the, the national parks in the United States are owned by all the federal taxpayers. So technically, anything found there or abandoned there belongs to the taxpayers. It's, there's no finders keepers rule in any national park. And again, I don't think Forrest was stupid. I don't think he would risk his entire estate to put it in an illegal place. So I just, I mean, I just ruled it out. So wherever, you know, wherever your solve is, you should be able to explain it from beginning to end. And you have to have a very precise starting location that is based on zero bias. And I didn't come to this conclusion until 2017. It was tough. We threw away a lot of work. Because I realized the sink is biased. Flaming Gorge, biased. You know, Meadowlark Lake, biased. Kerwin, biased. Cody, biased. I mean, everything I had was biased on what I think. Well, Forrest Fenn loved that museum. He must have went there. Or Forrest Fenn loved art. He must have went there. That's not true. Because you don't need to know who Forrest Fenn was to solve the poem. So anyway, people, I want to keep it short today. I just wanted to throw that out there. Be sure to click like and subscribe and click that bell icon if you want to be notified of when I come out with new videos. And as I said, I'm slowly moving away from Forrest Fen, and I'm going to get into other interesting solves here. So everybody have a good weekend. Peace.